Training in a fasted state, for example after skipping breakfast or lunch, is a popular way for people to lose body fat and to improve conditioning. In this video, I will show you that fasted training indeed prepares the muscles to burn more fat, but that it does not necessarily improve performance, at least if you do it in a regular way. I will show you a more extreme way of fasted training. I did it myself, but there are several scientific papers showing that this way of fasted training can actually improve your performance. This is part two of the coaching series, where I talk about the latest advancement in technology, nutrition, but also psychology to improve athletic performance. If you want to see part one, just click above. And for now, let's go straight into it. Hi everyone, I'm Gomar. I'm a senior scientist at ETH Zurich, based in Switzerland. I spent the last decade of my life studying the interaction between exercise and nutrition and how that affects performance. I've published dozens of peer-reviewed papers in this field and now I want to provide some of that science back to you guys. All right, let's jump straight into it. Human performance is stagnating. Over the last 30 to 35 years, performance in both endurance competitions such as a marathon, but also a more explosive event is kind of stagnating. You see this from the 70s and the 80s onwards. So instead of asking the question, why is this happening? Maybe a more relevant question would be to ask yourself, how can we stop the stagnation? Or at least, how can we keep improving? And then you always have to look at, let's say, two pillars. First of all, technology. Obviously, technological advancements are going very fast nowadays with AI, with wearables and so forth. So how can we use that technology to improve recovery, to improve training adaptations? So, but today I want to talk about nutrition and more specifically, how can we use carbohydrates and how can, you, can we periodize carbohydrates to improve our training adaptations and improve our performance on the long term. Good. First of all, if we talk about carbohydrates and we talk about performance, we know that carbohydrates are king during performance. Why do I say that? For example, this is an overview study from 2014 already, where on the X axis uh, total exercise time is shown so going from 50 minutes to a very long time and then on the y-axis the increase in performance compared to a placebo so if the people took carbohydrates compared to people who did not take carbohydrates or water as a placebo and you can see the longer the exercise time the more benefit a person has or an athlete has of taking carbohydrates so during competition there's no issue carbohydrates are king and that is because it is just more efficient to burn glucose or carbohydrates compared to burning uh, palmitic acid or free fatty acids or fats, all right? You get approximately 7% more energy out of burning glucose compared to uh, burning uh, free fatty acids. So when the intensity goes up, the body prefers to burn glucose and carbohydrates over fa free fatty acids, all right? So that is something that we know already for a very long time. The question now is, okay, we know we need them for competition, right? But do, do we also need these carbohydrates for, let's say, training adaptation? Because that's the whole goal of training, right? To improve our adaptations to that specific training bout. So, for example, if you would do exercise, obviously you decrease the stores of glucose inside your muscle and inside your liver. We call this muscle glycogen. I will talk about this a lot, so remember that word. So if you do exercise, you decrease the amount of glycogen. And then if a person would refrain from carbohydrates in that period, for example, during exercise or during a low carbohydrate diet, would they then improve, for example, the adaptation to that uh, training by, for example, improving the amount of mitochondria you make or the oxidative capacity, so the, the ability to burn fat, to, the ability to use oxygen, as well as uh, yeah, getting them better in performance. So that is the, the whole uh, question here. And there's a, a couple of papers related to this, and I want to share two of those because they're really um, important in the field, and I think you can also learn a lot from them. First of all, what did this paper do? It's from Barlett et al. from 2013. And they did a very interesting, let's say, acute 
training protocol that, that I just explained in the previous slides. What they did, just uh, look at, for example, the, the upper part here. First, they uh, came into the laboratory, had a low carbohydrate diet, and then they uh, did a glycogen depleting protocols. This means that they did some uh, biking, so it was mostly biking, to really deplete and decrease the amount of glycogen or sugars inside the muscle. And then they slept, uh, had, a, had a night's sleep, and then they came into the lab fasted, so without any uh, breakfast or, or, or any, any food, and then they did a, a hard six time three interval uh, session at 90% of VO2 max, right? That's the low group, let's say. And then uh, seven days later, it was randomized, but the same people came back and then they did the high protocol, meaning that they did the same, but they did not have this glycogen depleting protocol and ate high carbohydrates. Obviously, the next day they did exactly the same uh, running bout. And now we want to know if we take muscle biopsies before and after this period, what would actually happen yeah, with the singling and, and if the, the, the training adaptations would be improved. First of all, what is clear is that the muscle glycogen uh, was indeed depleted yeah, before and during the whole exercise session, right? The black bars here are the high carbohydrates uh, group and then the, the white bars are the low carbohydrates and what you see here is just the amount, literal amount of muscle glycogen uh, that the people measured and before, post and three hour post the exercise session, obviously it was all lower in the low. So that was obviously their intention and that was just to show that it all worked. And what you then see, this is a, maybe a little bit of a, of a diff difficult graph but it doesn't really matter, they just measured let's say some markers of the mitochondria, how well they were able to yeah, provide energy with oxidative sources. Good. So think about it as a marker on how well your mitochondria and your, let's say, your powerhouses of the muscles are working. And you can see here that the, the, the bar is a little bit higher with the white ones. That means that the low carbohydrates group had actually a larger increase in this specific marker of mitochondrial biogenesis, as well here another marker. So you see here, pre as well as post exercise, they had a, a stronger adaptation to the same exercise bout, right? So the only thing that was manipulated here was the, the carbohydrate availability, or at least the glycogen in the muscle. So that's very interesting. Obviously it's an acute study, they just looked at the training adaptations, they didn't look at performance. So now there's also a paper coming from, or a, a whole study coming from my previous PhD in Belgium, I did my PhD in Belgium, and here they looked at the effects of fasted training. So it was not an acute bout of exercise, it was rather a long-term training bout. <laughs> So what they did, they had just some students, so 20 to 24 year old, and they were divided in two groups. One group simply did not eat breakfast, right? And the other group ate breakfast. But in total, in general, the whole day, they ate the same amount of carbohydrates. That's important. That is the typical form of carbohydrates periodization. You eat the same amount of carbohydrates, but it fluctuates throughout the day uh, when you eat the carbohydrates. What did they do? A simple six-week endurance training protocol where they biked for one to one and a half hour um, yeah, at 70% of VO2 max. It's just a certain intensity that was fixed for everyone. Good. So what happened? Interesting enough, there was no increase or there was, a, there was no further increase in VO2 max, so that's a typical endurance capacity measurement, how fit a person has become. They both, both groups improved, so the fasted group and the carbohydrate group improved by 9%, which is typical in an untrained population. And also the time trial performance, they had to do a time trial on the bike, did not improve further, right? So even though there were some um, seemingly some adaptations inside the muscle to be able to use more fats to produce energy, it doesn't mean that the actual performance improved. And that is exactly what you see here. This is a cross-sectional uh, section of a muscle. So you see here the, 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 the nice fibers. It's, it's quite beautiful, I have to say. And the red staining means the, the fat droplets that are inside the muscle fibers. And you see here, if you eat a large amount of carbohydrates and you don't periodize, so you don't do the fasted training, so this is the carbohydrates uh, high and no fasted training group, the, the body uses these fats less. So you see here from pre-exercise to post, there is a slight decrease, but not that much. But in the fasted training guys, they are able to use their fats stored within the muscle much better. Again, that's just a single 
of training adaptation, but it doesn't mean that the actual performance was increased. In this case, it was not. Many other papers have shown similar things, a nice increase in single adaptation, but no improvement in performance. It's also not so easy to find performance improvements, right? So that is, you can think, okay, so carbohydrate periodization, it's nice, but it's actually dead, right? It's not important at all. Maybe that's not entirely true because then science kept evolving and people remained thinking about like how can we improve and how can we find a strategy that we can actually use this uh, carbohydrate periodization to improve uh, performance, right? So not only in the muscle, but also performance. And then they came up with a crazy protocol called sleep low. So bear with me because this is important to understand how the protocol actually works. What is sleep low? You think about it, just, just look at this, this part where the, the fasted people are, are in the protocol. So first of all, a person comes into the laboratory or just uh, is at home and eats a large amount of carbohydrates during, uh, during the breakfast as well as in, uh, during lunch, right? So six grams per kilogram of carbohydrates, that's a lot of carbohydrates. Then they ate a couple of carbohydrates in the afternoon and then they don't eat carbohydrates very 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 long time until the next day 10 11 a.m good what do they do after the last time they ate carbohydrates they do a hit protocol because they are fully deep uh, sorry fully repleted with carbohydrates their, their, the glycogen uh, stores are full they can do uh, a full out hit training so with high intensity for example crossfit session bike session running session then they don't eat carbohydrates, only eat a little bit of protein or drink a little bit of protein. And then they go to sleep, obviously. And then the next day, they are obviously very depleted. They feel very weak. So we're not going to put them on a high intensity protocol. No, we're doing for 120 minutes, so two hours, easy bike session uh, at, let's say, zone two or a little bit above uh, zone two bike session. Good. Afterwards, they eat a lot of carbohydrates again. The fat group does exactly the same protocol exercise wise, but they always eat carbohydrates structured also in the evening. And then they do also the same amount of, of, of bike session, right? So again, a typical form of carbohydrate periodization where you can yeah, structure your carb carbohydrates throughout the day. And what happened here, and that's interesting, is that actually only the group that did the sleep low protocol, that did mostly a running time trial, so they did a 10K time trial, only those people improved their performance over three to four weeks. The other people who did not do any carbohydrate periodization, periodization but did exactly the same protocol, that's important, they actually did not improve their uh, performance. So that's the first paper and all our other papers using the same protocol have uh, backed this up. It's the first, let's say, data showing that you can improve your performance with carbohydrate periodization, which is very cool, I think. Interesting, obviously, this is, this is some scientific data, but I wanted to test this myself. So what did I do two years ago with the What Science platform? I asked people if they uh, wanted to do the same thing, literally this sleep low protocol. And also here, we found a 15% increase in FTP. So this is basically the average power that you can produce over 20 minute rowing test. Good. So also from my own experience, uh, this seems to work because five years ago or six years ago during my PhD, I did this myself, this sleep low protocol, just to feel how it was. And I have to say it's quite hard the first time to, or the first week, first two weeks, because you have to go to bed without any food. But then I got into the groove and I, I myself also improved my VO2 max by 15%, which is obviously very high. This doesn't mean it's it's it necessarily better than uh, no carbohydrate periodization, but at least for me, this really worked. So this is something you can think about with your athletes uh, in the off season, for example, to improve their conditioning and to uh, have an extra boost on the training adaptations, implementing this train or sleep low protocol. Good. So take home. Training in a fasted state boosts the signaling inside the muscles, for example, the enzymes and the proteins, to get better at endurance and to mostly fat burning. But that does not mean that it actually improves performance, right? So regular fasted training where you just skip breakfast and do a fasted run for two hours. So you have to push probably the system a bit more by doing first a hit session fully repleted, so with carbohydrates, then sleep without carbohydrates, come back the next morning and do a long bike run, bike or run or swim uh, at low intensity, again, without any carbohydrates. And afterwards, you eat your carbohydrates, so you have a lot of carbohydrates, obviously, throughout that 24-hour period. 
So that's how you can use carbohydrate periodization to improve your performance. I would say test it out on yourself, test it out on athletes, and tell me in the comment section or coming back to this video how that went. That was it from my part for today. Hope you liked this video. If you did, give us a like and a subscribe. It really helps out the channel. If you missed part one of the coaching series, I have an in-depth look on how to program for hybrid sports such as CrossFit and Hyrox. Just click the video right here.